Well, we're diving back into the book of Genesis. Uh, we've finished a series on the Sermon on the Mount. We spent some time at Easter looking at the Easter story. And we're now going back to pick up the story that we started. It was actually started in 2020 and finished in 2021, I think. Is that right? I think so. Uh, with the Tower of Babel. No, started in 2021, finished in 2022. There we go. There's this sort of time warp around those years, isn't there? Um, we're picking up with the story of Abraham coming close to its end, but I thought it might be helpful to uh, recap where we've got to so far. So, Genesis, the story so far. I thought I would avoid the words that people commonly associate, creation, fall, flood, all of that, and instead um, give a bit of the flavour of what's happening. But we're skipping through 22 chapters of history here, so it makes sense to, uh, to have a bit of a recap. So we started off in Genesis 1 and 2 with God creating a perfect world. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, and then he created the pinnacle of his creation, man and woman, in his image, and it was very good. And that's where our story starts. And then, very soon afterwards, there's a rebellion. We talk about it as the fall, but Adam and Eve decide that they would rather have their own standards of good and evil than accept God's standards of good and evil. There's a rebellion. And this leads to a subsequent decline in this perfect creation. We see sin spinning out of control. We see murder. We see abuse. We see people turning away from God to the point where, at the beginning of chapter 6 of Genesis, it has got so bad that the Lord says there needs to be a clean sweep. And there is a judgment on the earth, but also a rescue of Noah. We have three chapters of that. It's then followed by a filling of the earth, but there's a question mark around that. You see, God's original mandate to man and woman was be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. That's not subdue in the sense of, you know, sort of pin down like a wrestler, but this is subdue in the sense of tame, cultivate. The earth is there to be stewarded. And that mandate continues after the flood as the nations begin to divide and spread out, except that because they are afraid and because they don't want to fully walk into God's mandate, they try to gather together. And we have this incident of the Tower of Babel where they, they say, let's make a name for ourselves. If we club together, we don't need God. We can make a name for ourselves. And we don't have to rely on this force that's outside our control, the power of God. And so we have this question mark around filling the earth. And it's a rather bleak place, the end of chapter 11. We've got humanity saying, let's try and go it alone without God. And into that, um, Star Wars fans, A New Hope, uh, we suddenly have this family of promise that appears. Well, I say family of promise. It's actually a couple of promise because there's Abraham and Sarai, or Abraham and Sarai as they are then, and God speaks a new word to them and says, go to the land that I will show you. And his promise to this couple grows over time. There's a promise of a land, a place to be. There's a promise of descendants, uh, children, even though they are old and beyond the age of childbearing. And there's a promise of flourishing with God, blessing, but not just for them to be blessed, but blessing so that they can bless others. All nations will be blessed through you. This is the promise that Abraham and Sarah end up walking in. And then, this is where we finished the series last time, that promise is tested. Isaac is the son that is born to them as a fulfilment of that promise. And God says to him, go and sacrifice Isaac on the mountain I will show you. And God gives Abraham these instructions and Abraham trusts him and goes off to sacrifice Isaac. And at the last minute, God stops him and says, now I know that you can be trusted because you didn't withhold anything from me. And he provides instead, and he provides a lamb to take the place, as a ram actually, sorry, to take the place of Isaac on that altar. And so we see this pattern set out that God provides a sacrifice that is fitting to save us, to rescue us, 
And that is where we finished the series last time with Isaac's not death. Which leads us into chapter 23. So if you have your Bibles, do feel free to open to chapter 23. Uh, no, just blank if that's okay, sorry. Thank you. So Sarah lived to be 127 years old. It's the only woman who has an age in the Bible, apparently. Um, she died, at least has an age of death. She died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I am a foreigner and stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so that I can bury my dead. The Hittites replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. Then Abraham rose and bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites. He said to them, if you are willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ephron, son of Zohar, on my behalf, so that he will sell me the cave of Machpelah, which belongs to him and is at the end of his field. Ask him to sell it for, to me for the full price as a burial site among you. Ephron the Hittite was sitting amongst his people and he replied to Abraham in the hearing of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of his city. No, my lord, he said, listen to me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that's in it. I give it to you in the presence of my people. Bury your dead. Again, Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in their hearing, Listen to me, if you will. I will pay the price for the field. Accept it from me so that I can bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, Listen to me, my lord. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver, but what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham agreed to Ephron's terms and weighed out for him the price he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weight current among the merchants. So Ephron's field in Machpelah near Mamre, both the field and the caves in it, and all the trees that belonged in the field within the borders were legally made over to Abraham as his property in the presence of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Afterwards, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which is at Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave in it were legally made over to Abraham by the Hittites as a burial site. As you read through the passage, you might be thinking now, you know, there were whole chapters devoted to this gathering together of people and trying to build a tower to reach the heavens. There was a three chapters given over to Noah and the flood and the rescue. And here we have nearly a whole chapter given over to a purchase, a negotiation over land. But this is actually a really key passage for us. And I want to dig into why that is. And there'll be some application for us before the end as well. We picked up already that in the previous chapter, Abraham has essentially received Isaac back from the dead. That's how the book of Hebrews describes it. It says that um, Abraham believed that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead, and, and in a way he did receive him back from the dead. <coughs> but not Sarah. Abraham's wife Sarah dies, and she remains dead. And we may think, well, of course, that's how things work. But we have this new hope in the people of Abraham, Abraham and his family, this new hope that they will be a nation that will bless and that will increase and through whom all nations will be blessed. And yet the problem of death is not solved. This curse that came on humankind when we turned away from God's standards and instead chose to define right and wrong for ourselves, that curse is not broken. Not in Abraham and his promise not in Isaac's near sacrifice, and not now. The curse of death still sits, and it will be many, many decades, many centuries, before Jesus comes to break that curse 
It's also important because this is actually the first instance we have in the Bible of weeping. Despite all that has gone before, nowhere yet in the scriptures has the the Holy Spirit seen fit to tell us of weeping that goes on. Now, I'm sure it must have happened, but this first mention of weeping highlights to us that Abraham is a man of faith, a man who walks in promise, and yet he's also someone who grieves. I don't know if you've ever heard people kind of just tough it out through um, difficulties and, and not acknowledge difficulties because they think that somehow that's opposed to faith. Abraham is a man of faith and yet he grieves. And in fact, the depth of his grieving is considerably greater than some uh, future relationships we read about. This highlights the depth of relationship between Abraham and Sarah. And actually, we want to come back to that as we look later on at Isaac and Rebecca, Isaac, their son, and his wife, where perhaps that marital relationship is not quite as strong. And yet, it's just three verses given to Sarah's death. And then the rest of the chapter is all about buying and selling land. What is going on here? Well, we don't know very much about the society of the time. This is about 2,000 years ago. And unsurprisingly, we don't have huge amounts of information about how transactions worked 2,000 years ago, um, about even what shekels were worth. You may have read, those of you who've dug into commentaries on this, people saying, oh, well, that price was very high for the land. The truth is we don't actually know because shekels went up and down in value. When all of this backwards and forwards was going on of, listen to me, no, no, listen to me, no, listen to me, that may have been just how business was done at the time, or it may have been totally unusual. We don't know. But why do we have two-thirds of a chapter of business transaction? I want to suggest to you this is absolutely key Because what's going on here is the beginning of Abraham really stepping into God's promise for him. God promised him a land that he would show him. And so far, all he's done is walk around the land. Now, God's blessed him in that. He's he's gone all over and his flocks and his herds have increased. And far more importantly, his family has started to grow and to, to prosper God has done right by him and by Sarah, but he has yet to possess any land. He's yet to actually own this promise that God has spoken to him. And what we see here highlighted is that the land that he walks into, the land that he ends up buying, is not a gift that could be revoked. It's not something that's kind of sold at a cut price because it was no good. But that this first concrete sign of God's promise being worked out was paid for fair and square out of the goodness and bounty of God, not out of the bounty of the people around him, not out of Abraham's own resources, but because God had blessed him, he was able to purchase this site. And it was bought and it was given over irrevocably. This is an important thing when we think about God's promises generally. God makes promises and they are irrevocable. Because when he promises something, he doesn't change his mind like people do. This land is given over irrevocably to Abraham and his descendants because that was God's promise. So how do we tie these two bits together? We've got the mourning at the beginning, this this weeping. And then we've got this entering into the promise. Well, I was listening to... Uh, somebody talking about this. Occasionally, I want to get a different person's perspective on a passage, and I was looking around to see who had preached on this. I found a a guy who'd done an hour and a quarter just on this chapter and enjoyed starting to dig into that. Um, And, you know, when you listen to somebody you've not listened to before, you always come with a degree of caution. I I wonder what approach they're going to take. I don't know who this person is, so I want to be guarded about uh, what they say. And There was something about his tone that grated with me, and after a while I realised it was because he was talking very freely about death and which death was harder, and he he said, you know, I I think it's actually harder to lose a spouse than it is to lose a child, because when you lose a child, you can grieve with the spouse, but it's much harder the other way around, and I thought, this feels very arrogant. And as he went on, he just mentioned in passing that his first wife had died about 30 years before. And the Sunday after, this had been the passage that he'd preached on. Um, And that 12 years after that, his daughter had died in a car accident 
and that he hadn't preached on this passage since that first time. And I realized that actually, although he was speaking confidently about God's promise, it was from a place of very personal experience. He had experienced the loss both of a wife and of a child, in both cases, sudden and unexpected as well, whether that makes it harder or easier, judge for yourself. But it was not an arrogant pronouncement. It was born out of experience. Here was somebody who had grieved and yet had not let go of God's promises and God's goodness and was able to speak about both. And this is the Abraham we meet in this passage. He grieves, but he is not despairing. He grieves, but he doesn't let go of God's promises to him. God's promised him land, so when he needs to bury Sarah, he buys land in the promised land. He invests in the promise that God has called him to. For him, grief and loss are not opposed to the promise, but more than that, they're not even setbacks from the promise. We can see griefs and burdens in that context, can't we? God has called us to this, but there's all these obstacles in the way, and and we can see them as though they're a surprise to God. But when God calls us, to live the life that he has for us. And and remember that all the days of our lives are written in his book before even one of them came to be. That's what the psalm says. He, He knew all the things that would happen to us. Nothing catches him by surprise. The death of Sarah didn't catch him by surprise. The things that you and I carry or encounter or will encounter tomorrow or next week do not catch him by surprise. And so we need to, if we're going to see life from God's perspective, we need to take that step back from being in the moment and surrounded by all of it and remember that God knew all about that when he called us to the life that he called us to and that the promise still stands. Just as we talked about earlier in Psalm 23, God leads us by green pastures and through the valley of death. And both of those are part of the walk that he has for us. So it's good to know what God did with Abraham. It's good to know that his promise stood and that Abraham chose to be faithful in investing in that promise. But what I want to do really is bring this back to us and our lives. The scripture speaks to us about what has happened, but it speaks to us also about us and our lives. And I want to start by saying, what are your sorrows? What are your griefs? What are your burdens that you walk with? There are different sorts of of sorrow, aren't there? There's the sorrow that you walk with day after day after day that has been going on for so long and you cannot shake it. And then there's also the unexpected sorrow that comes out of nowhere, that phone call about a relative who has suddenly died. For instance, that letter that comes through the post with a diagnosis you weren't expecting. And this is not theoretical. We we know each other. We know each other's lives to greater or lesser extents. We know about bereavements and about disabilities, about chronic illnesses, about divorces, about people who are single and don't want to be. We know that this is part of our life together as a community. This is not theoretical. And I suppose into that, I want to say two things from this passage. And the first is that it is a Christian thing to mourn and to grieve. And that is not somehow being less than faithful. If we acknowledge that there are sorrows and griefs that we wish were not the case and would love God to take away. But the second is this, that it hasn't caught God by surprise. Abraham had promises over his life. He had promises of a land. He had promises of a future. He had promises of blessing, to be a blessing. What are the promises over your life? There are some general promises in the scriptures. I'm going to read a couple to us. But for many of you, you will have individual things that God has spoken to you when you've been praying, things that he's set ahead of you, things that he's called you to do, which you know are part of your walk. There will be choices you've made 
um, particularly choices that involve covenants like marriage or parenting, uh, which also carry with them a calling and a promise. So what are the promises over your life? Just take a second to ask those questions. What are the griefs and the traumas and the sorrows that you walk with? And what are the promises? Just have a minute or two of silence and call to mind a few things. I'm not going to ask people to share specifics, but just wave a hand if you found the sorrows question difficult to answer. Okay, wave a hand if you found the promise question difficult to answer. Okay, so we, that there are sorrows in our lives, there are promises in our lives. If you struggle with the idea of promise, I want to read a couple of promises that God makes for all of us who accept Jesus Christ. This is from Ephesians. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Part one. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Part two. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He's chosen us to be holy and blameless, and all of our lives are to be lived out as a praise to God's glorious grace. People looking at our lives should feel inclined to praise God to whatever extent they understand that our lives are bound up with his. Those are promises for us to carry. There's another one which Jesus claimed for himself and imparts to us. This is from the book of Isaiah. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendour. These are promises we carry, promises that we are chosen, promises that we belong to Christ and that he blesses us, And then also, as we've just read, promises that that blessing spreads out to those around us, that both in terms of people and in terms of the structures of society, we can be imparting God's blessing to them. Those of you who work in the public sector, there is a call on your life to impart God's blessing to the world through healthcare, government, whatever it might be. Those of you who have a place within the family, there's a call on you to see society honouring parenting and marriage. Wherever you are, whatever sphere God has put you in, there is a call on you to be God's salt and light in that place. And these are all promises we carry. So how do we put those two together? We are the inheritors of incredible promise, and yet we carry incredible griefs. Some of you more than others, I know, but between us, There is a lot of grief in this room and there is a lot of difficulty in this room, ongoing and sudden. The challenge of this passage is to hold both of those, not to let go of the fact that there is sorrow, but to understand that that is not an obstacle to walking into those promises of God. How do we overcome? Well, I'm not sure we always do overcome those sadnesses, 
but we do walk through them and we do walk into God's calling. Did Abraham grieve Sarah all the rest of his life? We don't read it in here, but I'd be very surprised if he didn't. There's a passage with one of his children, Jacob, who after an encounter with God walks with a limp for the rest of his life as a reminder of that encounter. There are those of us who walk with a limp as a result of things that have happened to us, but we still walk into promise. How did Abraham hold that promise so tight? How did it become so embedded in his life? How was he able to pass on the tradition of what God had spoken to him to the point that when it was finally written down much, much later, it was accurately preserved? I want to suggest that he turned that promise over, that he talked about it with Sarah, that he talked about it with his household. No doubt he talked about it with Isaac, probably with Rebecca. And so I want to encourage you to be those who talk about the promises God has made for you with each other, as well as sharing our difficulties and our sorrows. And I want to encourage us to be those who pray about them as well. Now I realise this morning might seem quite solemn in this regard, and it isn't a passage that lends itself to levity, but there is a joy and a strength in this for us. We have in us the overcoming spirit of Jesus Christ, who enables us to stand, who enables us to walk, who enables us to take hold of God's promise. We may suffer, we may be weak in ourselves, but in Christ we are strong. Paul says this, doesn't he? He lists off all the things that he has felt crushed, beaten down, but not destroyed, not despairing. There's a strength that comes from the Spirit of God within us that enables us to overcome that enables us to walk into God's promise. And so rather than say that one more time, I want to encourage us instead to break into groups and to pray again. Maybe if it works for you, the same groups that we prayed in before, but there's a couple of things that we need to ask and a couple of things we need to pray, really. Can you advance one more, please? Thank you. And the first is this. What are the callings or promises over your life? Now, these might feel quite intensely personal, particularly if they are specific to you, things that God has spoken to you about, called you to. But I would encourage you that the people of God is a good place to share that, however intensely personal it might feel. There's no obligation, but there is a strong invitation that this is a good thing to share with each other. And then why not pray together that you would hold to those promises, just as Abraham held to his promise that you would see them fulfilled. Abraham didn't see those promises to him fully fulfilled, but he saw the beginning of it. And pray that through them you bring glory to God. As we walk into God's faithful promises, we bring glory to him. And the second part of it then is, what are the griefs or the burdens that you bear? Now, for some of you, you will have shared that quite openly. For others, I imagine there's something that you just don't really talk about very much. But I strongly believe that if we just keep it to ourselves, we actually don't build the church as we might. What are the things that you find difficult? What are the things that sometimes you don't want to get out of bed because you're thinking about them? What are the things that still cause you to have a reaction when you walk into a similar situation because that happened to you? And then there's prayer to be done there as well. Prayer that God would help us to see them through the lens of promise. That God's promises weren't caught off guard by those things that happened to us. There's a place for anchoring sadness within the promise. And then let's pray for each other that our response to those things would be in keeping with God's promises and calling. I started off by talking about this pastor who I was listening to who had lost both a wife and a daughter. He grieved those, and yet he also 
continued in the call of God on his life to be one who cared for others. There was one way he could have looked at that, of God's taken all this away from me. But instead, he saw it as part of his walk of the promise. No doubt out of that grief, he was more able to relate to some people who needed to be able to talk to somebody who understood. Is there a lens on your griefs and sorrows that God wants to give you where they are actually forming a part of God's promises to you? I want to encourage you there is. Let's pray that God would reveal those to us. In just a minute then, we're going to break into those groups again. I'd encourage you to share as openly as you feel able to and then to pray together for these two things. After a little while, uh, we'll come back together again. And there's a song that we're going to sing. Uh, We have sung here before a few times. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. And the refrain is, hallelujah, our God reigns, which is true no matter what else is going on. So let's break into groups now. Let's share. Let's pray. We've got a good five, ten minutes for that. And then we'll finish by coming together in song again.